Hi, yeah, thanks for coming by this rainy day. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about Arctic berries and you're gonna see, I'm gonna make a very big detour and at some point you're gonna think where are the berries in there, but I think it's really important that I do this big detour so that you understand what I want, what was the point with the berries. Um, so it's, it's why if you read the description uh, for this talk, I wanna bring you on a journey for, on, for the biocultural system of the berries, which is a term I really like because it's a biological system, but it's also part of a cultural system because people in the Arctic, uh, mainly the Inuits, which are the main, um, main inhabitant of the Arctic and also um, the Aboriginal nation that were there traditionally, they, they've been using the berries for centuries and they're still using the berries. So let's see how that works. Yeah. So what about the Arctic in Arctic berries? Well, we have different representation of the Arctic and I wanna go a bit over that. Uh, I've been working in the Arctic for the last eight years, only summer, so I'm kind of cheating. I'm not going there in winter. Uh, it's good I'm working on plants, so I have a good excuse to only go there in summer. Uh, maybe I'm just gonna take that out. So when we think about the Arctic, we think about glacier, mountain, very pristine les landscape. That's Axel Labor Island um, in the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. So if you remember your map of Canada, there's like this triangle in the top of Canada and there's a bunch of little islands and that's one of them. There's wildlife, very uh, remote. That's a bearded seal who's hanging out on a block of ice uh, on the northeast coast of Greenland. A uh, very remote camp. That's a camp on Warden Island, which is actually a tiny island. If you think again about the triangle with all the islands, this tiny island is on the tip of that triangle. And if we look in the ice, we look at the North Pole. That was a base camp that was organized, built by the US Army during the Cold War. And it's now used for Park Canada and a research station. And of course, all those um, very remote location have uh, supplies that came by helicopters. It's really difficult to go there and there's a scarcity of resource. That's one representation of the Arctic. And I take good care of like, these are all pictures of me or my colleagues. So it's possible to go there. It's not, um, the, none of the pictures are tricks, but it's one representation of the Arctic. How did you get there? Uh, by Twin Otter, which is the plane with the two um, turbine on the side. Uh, no, you, everyone fly to Resolute, which is the most northernmost like, uh, town in Nunavut, and then you take smaller airplanes from there. Uh, what does the Arctic look like for Inuits? So as I was saying, the Inuits are the main inhabitant of the Canadian Arctic, so, um, and they live mainly in Nunavut. You will, you, you'll hear too, I will talk about Nunavik, and Nunavik is the Inuit territories in Northern Quebec. Uh, this is a classic town. This is Pouvornituk uh, in Nunavik, so on the east coast of the Hudson Bay. Most of the town are located on the coast. Uh, here is the Hudson Bay. Yeah, so small little town. Uh, there's electricity, kids have bikes. That was the view from where I was living this summer in Arvias, which is on the west coast of the Hudson Bay. Uh, it's gravel road everywhere, and I will go back on that later on. Th I really love that one. So like, what are the main events in the community up north? That was the graduation of the high school. So there was three students that graduated from high school in Baker Lake that year, and they were making a procession with the fire truck, the policemen, all the sirens were on. Everyone was so happy and proud. So that's what the life is. Um, that's Iqaluit, which is the biggest town and one of the very few community where there's paved road. It's very exceptional. Uh, yeah, that's the syllabic of uh, Inuktitut. So the syllabic was actually a language that, sorry, Inuktitut wasn't a written language. So it's the priests when they arrive uh, in Nunavut and in the Arctic in general, they made up that language in syllabic. 
or that's written language. And there's dumps. It seems like a detail, but dumps are very, very predominant feature because they're stinky. Uh, they're very large, they're not very well managed, and so usually, they, often they will contaminate the water, they don't really know what's getting in the water, the water is not getting tested very well either. Um, it's also, they call it a Canadian tire, because lots of things are difficult to get in the Arctic, so you could go at the dump and get some nails or get some wooden parts you need to build something. Um, airplanes, because there's no road um, that link every communities together. So everything is coming by airplane. Once a year, end of summer, beginning of this uh, fall, they, there's a cargo boat coming. And if you want a car, if you want um, construction supplies, you need to order it about a year in advance. So it comes on the boat. If you miss your boat, you have to wait another year. So you can see if there's like weather problems, the plane cannot go in. People cannot go in and out, and it, there's no hospital in those communities. There's usually one nurse. Um, and it's the same for food. If there's lots of bad weather, the supermarket is going to be empty. Here is a Google map, very fancy aerial photograph from Kogluktuk, which is a, a community on the Western Canadian Arctic. I wanted to show you that picture because it really most communities are organized the same way. So you have the town here, you have the airstrip, which is bigger or about the size of the town, and you have a road. In this case, it goes to a lake. Often they call it the road to nowhere because it's just go in the tundra and every year they're gonna build it a bit more. Um, and here you have the sewage lake. So everyone have tank that get emptied there. Once again, like the dump, there's not a very good system. The water isn't really filtered, and it goes into the land. Uh, you have the dump, which look really small, but when they start burning the garbage, it's, it, you can smell it from town. And a gravel pit. So that's pretty much the organization for every community in Nunavut. So what I want to uh, show you is that here is a map of the um, Canadian Arctic no, sorry, of the circumpolar Arctic. And if we zoom on Canada, all the picture I show you at first are up north. So in that region that we call the I Arctic, while all the picture from the communities are from the low Arctic. So more, uh, going more south because no one's actually like there is, I think the northernmost community is here and Greece Fjord here. But otherwise, no one's living here because there's not that many resources. People used to go in those regions to hunt, and they still go a bit, but no one had permanent um, camp there. So I think it's important to know because um, to understand that the representation we have of the Arctic is not really representative of the reality of everyone. Uh, what are the main environmental issue in the Canadian Arctic? So climate change, here is a graph I think is interesting, just showing uh, increase in CO2 concentration and the increase in temperature. And we know that those, all the predictions say that those temperature will continue to increase in the future. And that has a direct impact in the Arctic because um, there's lots of permafrost, so the, the soil is frozen and uh, lots of the activities are regulated by uh, how you can travel on the ice. Here is a picture that I think depicts very well um, how the things are changing. So in the background is a glacier. What is blackish is um, the ground with a black lichen on it. And we know that the line where there's no more of that lichen was, uh, is about 1850. So there was a period called the Little Ice Age. So that was a, a bit of a colder period. And we know that the glacier were sitting there uh, at the maximum of the, that Little Ice Age period. So we know that the glacier have been receding um, of that distance. And it, it's quite striking. I've been working in front of a glacier for a summer and you could see the glacier 
moving as the summer were going. And because we're measuring it every year, we know it doesn't grow all the way back in winter. So there is like more and more uh, area which are being free of ice. Uh, looking at plants, because that's what I study and really love. Um, when I was talking previously about low and high Arctic, here, the um, uh, green line is where the trees stop. So we call it the tree line. And this area in pale green is called the low Arctic. And when we think about plants, the low Arctic is characterized by shrubs. So we don't have any more trees, but we can have very tall shrubs. And those shrubs will usually be in river banks or in more sheltered area. And when we, we, we cross that dotted line here, uh, we arrive in the high Arctic. So there's only very small shrubs. So nothing really much higher than ha that, maybe that. <laughs> and with climate change, we're expecting that uh, the trees will go up north and the tall shrub will go up north. And that may have lots of impact on caribou migration and um, how, you go, how you get around on the land. Because shrubs are really hard to get through. <laughs> They're really dense. Um, that's an example here of a study in Alaska. So you can see the first picture was taken in 1949 and the second one in 2000. And the, the, those black dots are shrubs, or a tall shrub in this case, uh, some species of alder. And that phenomenon has been documented all around the Arctic. So all the red dots on that maps are places where people have seen an increase in the uh, shrub cover. One of the other problem is the permafrost melt. And those pictures are from Alaska because there's more infrastructure in Alaska, so it's really a uh, it's very well documented in that region. And because as I was saying, lots of the communities are on the coast with the, um, the melt of the permafrost, the, there's lots of erosion on the coast and it's very difficult for the houses or infrastructure in general. And it's very difficult for the road too. They're having engineer nightmare there to try and maintain the road um, because everything is collapsing because it's like the, the ground was rock hard and now it's all melting. So it's it's not as stable. Local pollution, so I come back to this uh, photograph that I show you before. And I just want you to look, there's the airstrip here and there's a road passing here. So here is a picture of that community, so of Kugluktuk. Uh, I'm gonna zoom in. So the airstrip, oh, you can even see a plane on my computer, I can see it. <laughs> so there's the plane here and that dust was from when the plane landed, and that's a car passing on the road. Uh, most people are on ATV or walking. Uh, there's lots of dust. Uh, it caused lots of health issue, and all the landscape around that is covered with dust. Though it's, so it has an impact on the wildlife, on the plants. Uh, finally, um, as, uh, one of, I think it's the last one. So there's the, um, an issue with the pollution, which is more regional. So with the, with the air and the wind current, lots of the contaminant are concentrating in the Arctic. Um, and that will cause what we call bioaccumulation. So the very uh, small organism, uh, it's well documented in the ocean. That's why I'm showing you that. So those um, little herbivores will eat the algae and will eat a bit of contaminant. And as we go up the food chain, the fishes, the seal and the polar bear will have more and more contaminant because the concentration in the tissue of those organisms is getting higher and higher. And well, it have an impact on the health of those animals and also an impact on the Inuit who um, eat lots of the meat from the land to, uh, yeah, just eat lots of the meat from the land. So I talked to you a lot about Arctic, and now I'm gonna come to berries. Um, these are the four berry species that I'm studying. Uh, in A here, we have the blueberries. They're about that high. <laughs> and the berries are very small, so you have to be very patient. Um, cranberries, they're even smaller, but they're very pretty. 
Uh, here, most people up north call it the blackberries, but they're also called crowberries, and that's the name I'm going to be using because here it's a bit confusing. It's something else that we call blackberries. Uh, it looked like a little shrub. It has a bit. Um, it, uh, it has some needle-shaped sh leaves. Um, and here is the cloudberry, which is the biggest berries of them all. It's more rewarding when you go berry picking to take the cloudberry. And that's in the rose family. So it's, um, it's about that high. And you have a little stem with tree leaf and one berry on top of it. So there's only one berry on each of the plants. The good thing is that they usually grow in an uh, area where there's lots of them, so it's not too difficult to pick them up. Um, berries are collected by people. Uh, they have been, uh, this is a traditional food, but we know it has never been really important in the diets of the Inuit. And that was something that was tracking the explorer when, the, when they arrived in the Arctic, was that people weren't eating plants and they couldn't understand how people were surviving. And it's mostly because they were eating raw meats and all the organs in the meat. So they were getting all the vitamins that they needed even though they didn't have any plants in their diet. But we know though that it's important culturally because um, there is um, some sharing practice among the uh, Inuits and among also a lot of other Aboriginal culture. And so, so picking, if you pick berries, you can exchange the berries for fishes or you can share it with your whole family. It's really rare that people will preserve the berries, but everyone will receive some. And if you have a daughter that lives down in Ottawa and poor her, she doesn't have cloudberry, well, you're gonna send cloudberries by mail. And it's very common and they do that with the meat too. So it's something which is important in the town and they think it's also a good way to bring the kids on the land. And it's, it's less, uh, it requires less uh, resources than to go hunting because usually going hunting, you need usually to have gas, maybe a boat, um, you need to have a firearm. So it's not accessible to everyone. Um, Oh, and maybe one last thing is that it's uh, mostly a women activity too. While hunting was more traditionally a men activity, even though there's women who are hunting too. So it's, um, it's interesting to talk with people in the communities because you, you usually get in contact with women, which is an advantage for me. Uh, it's easier to get in contact with a good berry picker. Here are the animal species uh, that we know are eating the berries. So there's the Canada goose, the snow goose, the Arctic hare, uh, the lemmings, which are a bit like a small mouse, and the ground squirrel. We know, it's, we don't really know how much they, they are eating berries. We actually only have data for the snow goose, and we know that the berries um, are about 80% of their diet when they're migrating south, so that's when the berries are the most, are ripen. Uh, so that's a big proportion of their diet. And we know that the ground squirrel is eating it, but we don't have any data on um, like how much they are eating and how important it is. And, but that's a picture I took from a pieces of ground squirrel this morning. Uh, this morning, this, not this morning, this summer. Uh, and of course, they are eating some. <laughs> so we can see the berries are still whole in that piece. Um, so when, uh, for my research, what I'm looking at is the link between those different components. So the link between the human, the animal, and the berries. So uh, animals are eating berries, human are eating berries, um, human are also eating the animals, and then there's climate on top of that which is changing. Uh, maybe one little story that I think exists so well the link between, I should stop touching that, uh, all the, the, between all those components is that we made uh, interviews with people uh, in the communities, in one of the communities, and uh, the, a couple was telling that story that they were out at their cabin and it started to fight because the men really wanted to hunt the goose and the women really wanted to pick the berries. But the men said, don't pick the berries because the goose won't come. And the women say, well, like shoot in the air so that the goose don't land because I know I won't have any more berries if, uh, if the goose land here. Uh, okay, so 
just this first thing here between the climate and the berries. Uh, what we do is that I even brought my little, what we call a quadrat. So we take this little thing here uh, in an area of about 20 meters per 20 meters and we go uh, characterize that area for soil moisture, uh, soil temperature, vegetation cover, and we pick the berries. Uh, you can see after what I brought some of the berries that I just uh, took out of the freezer this morning. Uh, and we have a network, so I'm working with a large team, and we've established sites all around uh, Nunavut and Nunavik here in Northern Quebec. Uh, that's a project that started in 2008, and there's been more and more sites every year. What is really important when we look at climate is that we need to have a long data set. It's not possible, we cannot see, okay, I'm starting again. There's variation in climates and we need to have many years to be able to tease apart um, what is very just like something that happened one summer instead of something that happened in a longer term. So because I'm doing a scientific talk, I needed to put some graph here. So I, you know that I'm serious. Uh, that's one of the sites in Kugluktuk. That's actually the place I show you the um, picture from the town. So in 2010, we had only one site. 2011, we had two sites. 2012, three, and we are at seven in 2013. And that's the, the productivity, oh, and I wrote blackberry here, of one of the berry species. And if I just put that to show you that it's difficult to know, um, to, to predict, because the, it's not always the same plots. So we're in the same community. We have different sites that we visit. And some year they're high compared to the other, but some, th some year they're low. And we've been trying to tease apart what, um, what component of the climate might be influencing the pr productivity of berries. But that's a work in progress. And for the moment, it looks like temperature and precipitation, which are kind of the most obvious one, are not really having an impact. And we think that there's an influence of the snow accumulation, which is interesting because most of the time, people don't study snow in the Arctic because they just go there in summer and they forget that there's snow eight months a year but snow might be what uh, explain a lot of the productivity of those berries. And, to, um, and I got this new data set that I'm really interesting about, interested about, and that would probably help us to uh, tease apart those factors. Um, it's, if you don't understand what's written, it's because it's written in Finnish. Uh, I got in contact with someone in Finland and they have 40 years of data uh, at one site where they've been monitoring, here is the flowers, but it's the flowers and berries are um, really well correlated. So we, and you can see that there's a huge variation in the productivity of berries. And they have two sites. The one in red is the one that is um, the most similar to the site in the Canadian Arctic. The one in the blue, they have some trees, so we won't really look at that. But uh, yeah, so I'm, um, I haven't done it yet, but I wanted to show you because it's really rare to have that kind of data set of uh, 40 years. The other aspect that we're looking is like, if we're around a community, how is the landscape influencing how much berries are gonna be? Is there most berries on the top of the hill, at the bottom of the hill, closer to the riverbank? Uh, what type of, maybe there's some type of soil in which the berries grow better or not? So now we don't look through time, but we look through the landscape. And we did the same thing again. We collect the berries. That's Nash, who was my assistant last summer. Uh, and we collect feces from animal because we wanna know um, what's the uh, animal activity. And also we're gonna go look into their feces to see um, if there's seeds of berries. He really didn't like to do it. That's why he's making a little face. Uh, <laughs> So here is a map. There's lots of color on that map. And it's just to another work in progress. So all the different colors are different classes of vegetation. So that's someone else who did that. And what we us did last summer is we went to visit those red circle. So there's 35 of them. And so we set up that plot where we measure soil moisture, soil temperature, look at the uh, uh, vegetation collect berries, collect feces, and we wanna know where, do, um, where are the uh, berries growing better, 
and where are the animals going? And then because we have that map with all the different vegetation classes, we can combine that and know what's the berry productivity landscape wise and what's the animal activity on that same scale. And then we can say, um, we can have like hotspot. So ho places where there's lots of berries, lots of animals. Um, and then we can say, wh where are people going? So are animal and people going at the same places or are they not going at the same places? Or is there so much berry anyway that it's not really a problem? Uh, and the last part that we add on that is where is the pollution? So are animals and people going in the same places where there's pollution? Or, or is it so much pollution that people don't go berry picking anymore and it's not accessible anymore and it might have an impact on that social system that I was talking to you about, about that sharing system in the community. Um, so here is uh, Arviat. So you see here is the map with all the different plant classes and here is a Google map again from uh, that same community. Uh, you could see the airstrip, the town, the dump is here. Uh, and those areas uh, close to the community are really polluted. There's garbage everywhere. There's, um, the, uh, the dump is kind of seeping through and all that area is really polluted. Plus there's lots of polar bear on that coast so people don't really go there. Um, so what we see is like it's an hour walk to actually go in a, in a spot where there's berries which are of good quality and in a certain abundance. And that's definitely have an impact because um, it means that if you don't have the resource to have a car, which really like lots of people don't have a car, well then you won't go there. And you, you know, don't walk all that much either. Uh, we were walking last summer and everyone kind of stopped and laughed at us and were asking us if we wanted to ride. So it's not, uh, it's not something we do. So we know that people won't go all that much outside. Um, so that's it. That's uh, all work in progress. It's kind of where we are going. And because we work in the community, one of the things which is really important for us is to give back to the communities. And that's in Arviat too, where I just show you the photograph. And the, they're bringing this, the kids out of the land. There's a little lake there. They go swimming, they go berry picking. And that's really important for mental health. And they are up in the Arctic, they really like correlate how much you can go out on the land and be out of town uh, to, um, to help your, um, help your habits and help your people. There's lots of substance abuse and for the kids to get out of town is very healthy. Uh, one of the programs that we've been doing is we've been running land camp. So we bring elders and uh, youth together. It's usually organized in collaboration with the schools. And that was a really awesome camp that we did last summer. Uh, we had four women elders that show us different things about plants. They show the youths how to prepare the fish, how to prepare the caribou meat. And, uh, and they went out berry picking with us. Uh, another program is in uh, Nunavik. They've been implementing that protocol to pick up berries in this uh, science curriculum. So every school in Nunavik are going out picking up the berries and then they're sending the data back to us and we're doing the analysis and we're, we're just actually trying to work out right now what's the best thing that we can give back to them because so it's kind of an exchange in service. And, what they've been telling us is for, for them, this connection between research, like real research and um, uh, class activities is in itself really good because it motivates the, the student. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll just explain you my last photograph because I really like it and I think it show well, uh, well different mix. This is a dog team. Uh, it was in Igloo Lake, so in Nunavut again. The dog team is owned by a white school teacher. Uh, it's the summer and they have to run because they're a running machine. And so we tie them up on the ATV and they pull up the ATV. That's the very traditional way to run up your dogs in Nunavut. <laughs> Thank you.